While the city of Chicago has been called many things, one of the more unexpected nicknames might be the Hog Butcher of the World. You see, in the latter half of the 19th century, Chicago became the biggest railway center in the world, and as a part of that, the largest livestock center in the world too. Dubbed by an 1889 Chicago Tribune article as, quote, the eighth wonder of the world, the Chicago Union stockyards were originally just meant to bring all the city's stockyards together. They instead became a sprawling industrial behemoth covering 50 miles of land and polluting the Chicago River so severely that the flow had to be permanently reversed. These yards operated when the entire country was pushing towards industrialization, hence shaping the national meat and meatpacking industries in the whole city of Chicago before eventually falling behind the times and being left in the past. Today, we discover the rise and fall of the Chicago Stockyards. I'm your host, Ryan Sokash, and you're watching It's History. Chicago, Illinois has a long history as a large meat market. Slaughterhouses started becoming popular in Chicago in the early 19th century, with lumber slaughterhouses recorded as early as 1829, when tavern owners used to hold and maintain cattle herds to be sold for butchering because all slaughterhouses needed to get their meat locally so it could be butchered and sold without spoiling. Things started to change as railroads began spreading across the country and running through Chicago. Bringing us to the first privately owned stockyard, the Bull's Head Market, opened for business in 1848. Between the years of 1852 and 1865, five different railroads arrived in Chicago and each opened up a stockyard of its own. As traffic in the city increased, more livestock started getting brought in. More livestock meant more people needed to work at the stockyards. Chicago's population in 1850 ended up tripling by 1860. Of course, more people meant more demand for meat. Due to the Civil War closing down river-based trade routes, the stockyards and railway-based meat sources became the only option for meat for many Americans, giving the industry a significant economic boom as well. Chicago had become a central railway terminal in the United States, connecting the east to the west. However, the city's stockyards for many different railroads were all small, scattered, and as a result, inefficient. In 1864, the Chicago Pork Packers Association passed a resolution to consolidate the yards into one joint stock company. Nine railroads were combined to create the Union Stockyard and Transit Company. The company's main stockyards, the Chicago Union Stockyards, began construction in 1865 and opened for business on Christmas Day. When first opened, the Chicago Union Stockyards and associated slaughtering facilities took up approximately one square mile of land. They were directly connected to Chicago's main railroad lines for easy transport. The stockyards started big and just got bigger. They were processing two million animals yearly by 1870. By 1890, that number had jumped to nine million. Then. By the turn of the century, the Chicago Union Stockyards and its nearby slaughterhouses took up 50 square miles of land. The stockyards had 25,000 employees clocking in and were producing 82% of the domestic meat being consumed nationally. As a consequence of this growth, the stockyards were pumping 500,000 gallons of water from the Chicago River daily. And with this, the southern fork of the river earned the nickname Bubbly Creek because of the sheer number of runoff from the stockyards polluting the water after getting pumped in. Hence in 1900, the city of Chicago chose to permanently reverse the flow of the Chicago River to prevent that runoff from reaching Lake Michigan and contaminating the city's drinking water. One way or another, it was clear that the Chicago Union stockyards were here to stay and making a splash. Now, we don't have time to cover that story in detail, but if you'd like to go deeper into Chicago history, you can visit our sponsor Blinkist, where I got a much better context on this era of the city by listening to The Devil in the White City by Eric Larson. Allow me to explain. 
Blinkist is a fantastic service offering 5,500 nonfiction titles in just 15 minutes. So if you have some time this coming Memorial Day, it might be the perfect way for you to learn about America's most important historical events. Check out Songs of America, a blink about the songs that made the nation and another title that I really enjoyed. These bite-sized versions of the original work will educate and entertain you, which is why I prefer Blinkist to other apps. It's also a great way to expand your horizons with 27 categories, such as science, society and culture, productivity, and beyond. You only need 15 minutes to discover new perspectives and topics. Listen on the go while taking a walk, cooking dinner, or cleaning. Enjoy the download function for on-the-go use, whether you want to read or listen to a Blink. I'm telling you, Blinkist is more than just a book summary. It's a way to constantly learn new things. And the news gets better. Blinkist is commemorating Memorial Day with 50% off. So sign up to also find books like Tribe on Homecoming and Belonging, Killing the Killers, or The Gun Debate. Get a seven-day free trial and 50% off Blinkist annual premium by using my promo link in the description. And now, back to the stockyards of Chicago. The stockyards and their effects on the meat packing industry in Chicago ended up redefining the national meat market. In 1878, Chicago-based meat packing entrepreneur Gustavo Swift commissioned a design for a refrigerated rail car. And this would be a game changer. You see, previously, the scope of the market for meat produced at the Chicago stockyards was limited because shipping the beef too far meant risking that the product could spoil en route due to travel time. The introduction of refrigerated transportation meant that a slaughterhouse in Chicago that could only sell locally before could now sell pork chops in Seattle without any worries. As the stockyards continued to grow around the railroad industry in Chicago, meat companies such as Swift's moved to be around the Union stockyards in an area known as Packingtown, a name which soon became known as the leading center for slaughterhouses and packing in the nation. The industry continued to grow further as production became more and more focused on centralization and keeping costs low to stay competitive with local offers in the market. Before too long, a single meat company would control every stage of meat production from the livestock to the customer's purchase in the store. The actual packing process became more efficient as well. Companies could now profit from both the meat and the meat byproducts, refining them into valuable goods for sale. The packing process became so heavily industrialized to the point that the systems for packing meat inspired Henry Ford's famous automobile assembly line. Of course, those operations needed many people to man them, an amount of manpower provided by a large workforce of cheap, unregulated immigrant labor. Many workers started living in Packingtown to be near their workplace, earning the area a reputation as a notorious slum district that became known as the back of the yards. The location was crowded, poorly maintained, and known for having a horrible smell due to its proximity to many slaughterhouses. To offer a little emphasis here, these slums and the Chicago Union stockyards were the setting and focus of Upton Sinclair's 1906 novel, The Jungle, meant to inspire outrage on behalf of the working class and promote the Socialist Party. The Jungle details all the unsafe and unsanitary details of which the employees of the meatpacking district were made to work and the devastating effects it had on their lives. Despite the novel's focus on the workers' conditions, the part that outraged most of the readers was the detail about the sort of things that might end up inside of one's food. The public outcry gave President Theodore Roosevelt the support he needed to enact the Pure Food and Drug Act and ensure the quality of food sold to the American public. On the other hand, inspecting the workers' conditions led to very few changes. The lousy environment fostered much tension between the different groups of people working at these factories. Tensions between the Irish and African American workers specifically escalated into a full-blown race riot in 1919, ultimately requiring the intervention of the National Guard. On top of these issues with the workforce, the Chicago stockyards also faced threats from fire. The first Chicago Union stockyards fire started on December the 22nd, 1910. 
The incidents caused $400,000 in property damage. It also cost the lives of 21 firemen, who many decades later have been recognized as heroes, as in 2004, a memorial was finally built on the Chicago Stockyard property to honor the lives lost in putting out the blaze. Then, a second fire devastated the stockyards just 24 years later, on May the 19th, 1934. This fire burned nearly nine-tenths of the Chicago stockyard's total land. It could also be seen from as far away as Indiana. It was much more financially devastating, with the total damages estimated at around $6 million. And although there was less of a loss of human life with only one employee perishing in the blaze, it should be noted that roughly 8,000 livestock animals were also killed by fire. With fires raging and horrific pollution in the local waters, it slowly became clear to everyone that the local industry would soon see its decline. The Chicago stockyards and the stockyards in general had begun falling off by the mid-1900s. After World War II, even further innovation in transport and distribution made the stockyards obsolete. Then, advancements in refrigerated trucking meant that breeders began to sell their livestock directly to packers since it was now cheaper to have the animals slaughtered on site instead of shipping them to a stockyard to do it there. As buying locally and dealing with smaller sources became more cost effective, packers began closing down their now outdated plants. By 1959, Gustavo Swift and Philip Armour, two of the biggest packing moguls out there, closed down their Chicago packing plants as well, sending a clear signal that this was the end of an era. Eventually, in 1971, the area that had been the original Chicago Union Stockyards was rebranded as the Stockyards Industrial Park. The Chicago Union Stockyard Gate, where the entrance to the stockyards had once been, still stands over Exchange Avenue. And you might be surprised to hear that this area has officially been designated a U.S. National Historic Landmark. And perhaps with good reason. You see, the Chicago Union stockyards truly defined an industry, with many of the strongest characteristics of the modern meat industry first established in these plants and slaughterhouses along the old, forgotten railways. The packing slaughterhouses were a point of pride for Chicagoans for a good century and are still a large part of the city's history today. With the way the Chicago stockyards shaped the town's development, it wouldn't be a stretch to call them an essential part of Chicago history. And although the Chicago stockyards are no longer fulfilling their original purpose, the site is far from abandoned. You see, the Stockyard Industrial Park is still one of the city's busiest and most successful industrial sites. So rest assured, they won't be closing down anytime soon. And we'll leave it there for today. Please consider subscribing. And don't miss our video about the fate of Chicago's lost rock and roll McDonald's. Until next time, this is Ryan Sokash signing off.